Welcome to a live chat with Nurse Linda. Linda Schultz is a leader and provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 30 years and a friend of the Christopher and Dana Ree Foundation for close to two decades. Just a few quick notes before we start. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Ree Foundation's YouTube, YouTube channel. We will put the link for it in the chat box located at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions for Nurse Linda, please put the questions in the Q&A box also located at the bottom of your screen. There will also be closed captions offered for this webinar, again, located at the bottom of your screen. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Linda. Hi, Linda. Hello, thank you. And welcome everyone. It's always the highlight of my month to be with you on this hour on the last Wednesday of the month. So I appreciate you tuning in or if you're listening later, great. Um, today we're gonna to focus on skincare, which is one of the key issues with spinal cord injury, bowel, bladder, skin is what we always think about. Those are the three uh, priorities to maintaining health. And so there's a lot of um, information about skincare issues out there. Uh, the Reeve has, organization has a wonderful booklet all about skincare and there are pages about skincare, but still people have problems with uh, maintaining their skin after spinal cord injury and it's usually due to lack of sensation and the pressure that's put on the body from uh, lack of movement. So I'm going to uh, share my screen with you. I'm going to talk briefly and about um, pressure injury. Um, just in this just in this opening part, but maybe from a different point of view, I'm hoping because there's a lot of information about what to do and how to avoid it. And still people, some people do absolutely everything they can do. They go completely by the book. They follow every single rule and they still end up with a pressure injury. And then other people seemingly, maybe yes, maybe no, but seemingly they don't pay too much attention to it. They never get a pressure injury. So what's that all about? That's kind of crazy. But there are things that you can do to help yourself. But let me share my screen with you for a moment and um, talk about pressure injury just a little bit. Okay, this is a little bit new to me. So I'm hoping that you can see my screen. I'm thinking that you can. So if you can't, somebody's going to need to signal me in some way. But I think that you can see it. So let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about pressure injury. Um, this is what normal skin looks like. Um, it, if you have um, an injury to your skin, it starts from the bottom inside your body, and then you see the um, area in, on your skin where the pressure injury is occurring. This is what normal healthy skin looks like. You can see on The dermis is not as world weary as the That compresses, it doesn't disperse pressure. So it just smushes down. And it doesn't, you know, some people will say, oh, I've got plenty of cushioning on my backside. Uh, don't we all? Um, but that actually, that doesn't work in your favor because fat tends to collapse and it just adds more pressure. People who have too little fat layer sometimes have difficulty with skin issues as well as there isn't as much um, material in between your skin and your bones, even though the, the fat collapses and, and causes more pressure, you need, do need a certain amount. If you don't have very much fat, you're kind of missing a layer of protection as well. Below
you could invert this picture upside down. What happens is that this bone is hard, and when you're sitting on the surface of your skin, all that pressure of that bone is digging to all of these protection mechanisms that you have. What the pressure will first do is it will cut off the circulation to these little tiny capillaries. And we know how much pressure it takes for blood to go through the capillaries, the little arteries and little veins. Um, and they're feeding all the cells in your skin. And we know how much pressure that is. And it, it they don't... Uh, on your thighs and on the bottom of, on your bottom, when you're sitting, think about all that weight that's going from your torso, your head, your torso, your trunk, everything is being put on those sitting bones, all that pressure. When you're laying down and your body's flat, you only have the pressure of the weight of your head when on the back of your head or on your side, on your side, you only have the pressure of your torso, which is dispersed all over your entire back. So you can have a little bit longer times without doing uh, pressure releases. We'd like to say every 10 to 15 minutes, you should do a pressure release when you're sitting. And when you're laying, we say every two hours. Now, why do we say every two hours? We actually know the capillaries start um, having changes in pressure effects before two hours. But we say two hours, and why do we say that? Because Florence Nightingale said that a long time ago. So the patient should be turned every two hours, and we still do it that way. Um, what we have in our benefit now is that we can delay sometimes turning and keep that two hour because we have that, all those pressure dispersing uh, pieces of equipment, which helps uh, move the uh, pressure around. In this next slide, you see that little bitty bit of mucous membrane on top of the skin. So if your skin is very dry, it's good to put some um, lotion on your skin to keep your skin moist. That helps uh, keep uh, fluids inside your skin so that it's helpful for maintaining your skin. This is what a stage one pressure injury looks like on darkly pigmented skin and lightly pigmented skin. It's we call it what we call the dreaded spot. The second you see the dreaded spot, you need to stay off this area. And this is why talking about skin is so unpopular because people don't want to hear this. They've got things to do. They need to be up. They need to be moving around. Or, you know, you need to be doing things. But the minute you see this spot, on darkly pigmented skin, it's going to look kind of like a purplish spot, red to purplish. Um, or it might look uh, what some people will call ashy. So that might be the way that uh, you might uh, see your spot. Sometimes in really darkly pigmented skin, it's harder to see the spot. But when you look at your skin every day, you'll notice if there's a change in color. So once you get familiar with your own skin, of course, you'll notice these things. On lightly pigmented skin, you'll see more of a light pink or sometimes into any shade of uh, red that will be going on. Um, there's more contrast there in lightly pigmented skin, so it's a little bit easier to see. But really, once you get to know your skin, you'll know when you have the spot and you need to stay off of it. Now, this can be really hard to do. As I say, you've got things you need to do. Sometimes people say, well, I need to sit up while I eat. If the pressure soars on your backside. Or I just sat up for a minute to brush my teeth. Therein lies the problem. Even if it's for a minute, even if it's, if it's for a second. The minute you put pressure on your skin again, you're re-breaking down the capillaries yet again. So if you have a red spot, there's an issue with the capillaries. They're not able to get blood through. And that's why you have this red, red or purpley spot on your skin. So if you sit on the red spot, any healing, the capillaries will heal themselves pretty fast. Um, you know, skin is pretty uh, resilient and it will try to heal itself. But then when you reset or add pressure to capillaries that have been broken down, 
all that repair that they have been doing is going to break down again. So each time you add more pressure, you're making your sore worse, 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 worse. So if it starts to, the capillaries start to rebuild and they're starting to refill, you add more pressure, all that work that you've done, your body has done to re reform those capillaries and get the blood flowing again is suddenly um, destroyed. So it keeps, not only are you making more damage, but you're making worse damage as it goes along. Um, stage two, you can see it goes down into the, below the um, surface of the skin. It's going down into that capillary area. So you'll see actually an opening. Stage one is just that dreaded spot. Stage two, you'll see an opening and you might be able to even look down into it, but you're probably not gonna be able to look very far. It's not gonna be too much of a crater until you get to the stage three. And so when you see this stage three, um, you'll see that you're looking actually down into somewhat of a little hole. And you'll see how it's got this little reddened area around there. The capillaries have, have just died away, they're gone. And you can actually see tissue in there. You might see a little bit of the sloth. This is this white stuff. That's dead tissue that the wound is cleaning out because even though you have a wound, it's trying to heal itself. Even without you doing anything, the body's going to try to heal it. So that's going to be that's going to be important. When you get into wounds with these little craters like this, you have to start um, thinking about how that wound's going to heal. This skin up here at the top, the in the epidermis, is going to want to close over. That's its job, and that's what it's going to do. So it's going to try to close over this hole very quickly to protect your body. But if it closes too quickly, this area down here is gonna uh, still have the pressure injury there. And so what happens is if the skin on the top closes over, this can remain uh, an open crater, which makes it much more susceptible to breaking down again. But also it can um, have infection in it, which makes like a closed festering sore. And so it just builds up until it erupts again. Um, nasty business. We don't want that. And when you get into the stage three, you can, you'll go down into that fat layer and you can see you'll have more uh, visible of the sloth of trying to get the dead particles out. And so it's going down way, it's, you know, much deeper wound. And stage three and stage four can have what they call undermining or tunneling. They're two different things, but tunneling would be like a little tube that goes off like a tunnel off to the side where it's, you have the big main uh, injury, but there might be a little tube that goes off to the side, which can um, collect um, infection or cause other breakdown. Or you can have um, undermining, which is little offshoots where the wound is kind of going from the bottom and spreading out through the tissue a bit more. And that makes an unsupportive um, structure for sitting on. So both of those are kind of dangerous to have. And then stage, um, oh, this is a stage three with uh, what they call an epibole. So the skin is going to try to cl uh, close over. It's trying to close itself, but skin can be tricked. So when it gets into this open area, what it does is it's it's trying to reach across over here, but if it's too far to reach over, it tends to curl under. Then when it curls under and it gets feeling the uh, epidermis, so see how it's kind of curling under here? When it gets that, it says, oh, here's more epidermis. I guess I've reached my goal. So it, you kind of get this um, curved edge that then has to be removed because it's not going to grow anymore. It's growing the wrong direction now. It's growing underneath itself. So that will have to be uh, removed by your healthcare professional to get that top layer to heal up. The stage four, we see much more of the sloth. The stage four is down into the bone. And sometimes you can look into these wounds and you can see right down into them and you can see the bone in there. You have to be very careful though um, with these kind of wounds because if infection gets into that bone, it can quickly travel throughout the body because down here in the bone, in the center of the bone where the bone marrow is, 
that's a, a direct blood pathway into everything else in the body because that's where your blood cells are being made. So if that infection gets into those cells, they're just traveling throughout your whole body. So that's a really dangerous situation to be in. Um, stage three and stage four wounds can be healed uh, by doing dressing changes, staying off of them. I know a lot of people go to the to the healthcare professional, they go to the wound specialist and they'll say, oh, you, you know, you're on pressure dispersing equipment. And they'll say, you can go ahead and, and carry on your life, but it's gonna take a lot, 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 lot longer to heal up the wound. The only thing you can do to really heal a wound is to stay off of it. And that's what people really don't wanna do. Um, then we have these other kinds of things where you have this eshkar, this this dark stuff. It looks kind of like a scab, but it's a little bit more involved than a scab. So it's this um, kind of brown black crust that is over the top of the wound. So you can't tell what stage this wound is um, when you have all this eshkar. You might have enough sloth that builds up too that um, you can't see into the wound. You have to do an MRI or a CT scan to look at that wound to see how deep it is. If it's hit the bone, if it's infected, you can't see into it, but you wanna keep that eshkar or sloth on there because it's protecting bacteria from getting into the wound. It's protecting what's ever beneath it. Now, if there's infection in there that has to be treated, or if for some reason the um, healthcare professional does the MRI or the CT and says, we need to get this eshkar off of it, they'll have to remove it. Let them remove it, let them do that because they'll know what, the, what they're doing. Uh, the sloth can look very much, if, it, if the wound is very deep, it can look very much like a ligament. And I actually had um, an experience with a patient where um, his uh, uh, a caregiver, who was a hired caregiver, very experienced, had been in the military. And he saw the white, uh, what he thought was the sloth inside a very deep wound of his patient. And so he used his pocket knife which he sterilized with alcohol and over a candle flame. You know, I, oh my gosh. Um, and he removed the sloth, but what he didn't realize was sloth can look a lot like ligaments and he actually removed the ligaments of this patient. So let your healthcare professional decide what treatment needs to be done, how to do this, because it, it's very important into healing your wound that you get the right treatment. Something that we don't um, talk about a lot, but it's very important, are these deep tissue pressure injuries. And th this is not an open wound, but it's like a huge bruise that goes all the way down to the bone. It's because the circulation has been cut off. And so you see this uh, purple bruise. Again, this has to be looked at through some kind of scanning um, treatment. So, these wounds, uh, they have damage in there, but there's no open area. So you think, oh good, then there's no way for bacteria to get in there. Well, that's good. But they also take a lot longer to heal because they're so penetrating all the way down. Again, every time you add pressure, whenever you're putting pressure on the skin and that bony prominence is sticking up, then of course that's when you have the trouble um, with more injury to those capillaries. Uh, this happens sometimes through what's called um, shearing, where the um, a person's like transferring or somebody's moving a person. And what happens is that the pressure of the bone is still, they don't lift the person up off the surface, but they kind of drag them while they're turning. And so the pressure of the bone is still there in the the layers of skin and the layers of tissue in between are separating from each other. And that's what causes this uh, bleeding on the inside of the body. All these capillaries are broken. Another thing that you can have is a friction injury. And we do see these quite often. Again, it's when people don't lift themselves when they're moving. So the, um, the, the epidermis sticks, like if you're using a transfer board or you hit the wheel of your wheelchair while you're transferring and the epidermis kind of tends to stick. So this is held fast, but you're moving and the skin below it is moving underneath it. So it kind of separates that uh, top layer of skin from the other skin and that will look red. 
Sometimes you've seen little kids that are crawling around on the floor, they get a rug burn. That's kind of what it is, it's a rug burn. So you've seen those before. Now I do wanna uh, mention that um, there is a test and this is very important not to do this test. It's very important to tell your healthcare professionals to stop if they're continually doing this. So this is the Blanche test. Now I bring it up because you call your, you got a red area, you call your healthcare professional, you ask them uh, of what, what should I be doing about this? And they might say, well, does it Blanche? This is a test that's done where you take one finger, you push it one time on the red spot and you look to see if the capillaries will clear the blood out so the red spot will become more like tissue colored skin again or white. It loses that red or purpley color, but then it fills back up again. And that means that those capillaries are still working. And that means that you're gonna have a short time to heal this wound because things are headed in the right direction. If it's non-blanchable, that means those capillaries have been destroyed and probably the wound is gonna get worse before it gets better. Now, when you put your finger and you press it into that wound, press on the skin of that wound, what are you doing? You're pressing, you're adding pressure. So sometimes you'll go, the healthcare professional, maybe you're in the hospital, somebody will come in, they'll do initial exam, they'll check for blanching, Maybe they'll check three or four times just to make sure. No, one press, that's it. That's all they get. Don't let them poke around because they're just adding more pressure. They're making it worse, making it worse, making it worse. Um, then the next person comes in and you know maybe it was an aide that came in first, check the blanche. Then the nurse comes in checking for blanche. No, only one person gets to do it. And that is it. Then the doctor comes in, checking, checking for Blanche. No, just one person. So you need to be an advocate for yourself and say, if you're doing the Blanche test, please just do it one time. And are you the, are you the only person who will be doing it? Because if the doctor has to come in and do it, then let's just wait for him to come in and do it or her to come in and do it. So very important to don't let people keep poking, poking, poking at it. Every time they're poking, they're making it worse. So just some uh, important things to know about um, that skin care. Um, whatever the treatment may be, there's a lot of treatments for skin care. There's a lot of um, myths that go on about skin care. Um, it used to be, and I, I will say back when I was a nursing student, if we had a person who had a pressure injury, um, they would say, well, we have to massage it. Well, what happens when you're massaging? Pressure, pressure, pressure. So no massage, no massage around the area. They'd say, oh, we'll increase the blood flow. You're not really doing that. You're really just adding um, more pressure to the area. If you're rubbing or pulling around that area, you're causing more destruction of those capillaries. So no, we don't do that. Um, there was a thing about using alcohol and rubbing it with alcohol because that would stimulate blood flow. No, you're adding more pressure. It's not helping. Um, right now, there's a huge thing with honey and for open wounds, there's uh, some treatment and I've been following this pretty carefully. There's some very strong evidence that I'm using honey, now not honey from your neighbor's hive, but honey, um, medical grade honey. Um, honey in the hive is sterile. The bees make sterile honey, but there's a lot of things that go on in the hive. For instance, hives are notorious for uh, rodents because collecting rodents because honey sweet, they like it too, and they come to eat it. So sometimes hives can be infected with excrement from other animals that might have been by or so it's not honey from the hive, but medical grade honey that's been purified and you're really sure about. And then the honey is placed in the wound um, because honey that's been sitting around for a while might not be sterile, sterile depending on how it's been handled and you know all kinds of factors. So um, I did have a patient just within the last couple of months where the home health nurse came in and, and the patient said, oh, they've heard a lot about this honey and um, so they were going to eat the honey on their toast every day to help their wound. Well, 
that is not going to help the wound. The patient was also diabetic, so that was going to um, make their blood sugars go crazy. But um, there's some some very good evidence that says honey, uh, medical grade honey in wounds is very helpful. There's also some evidence that says not so much. So the journey is, jury is kind of out on that topic. So um, just be careful, always check with your healthcare provider, find out what is the right treatment for your wound. Um, some people will want the wound packed. Um, some people use wet to dry dressing. So you put the dressing in with uh, sterile normal saline on it so it's wet. It dries in the wound and when you pull it out, it's pulling out that eshkar or the sloth that's collected in there. And so, uh, so other people will want um, antibiotics, in, uh, lotions or ointments, uh, all kinds of things. Some people will want a wound back, but um, if those wounds are deep into the uh, tissue, you'll need to pack the wound with something in just generally speaking and to keep that dermis, that upper layer of skin from closing over because you need to heal the wound from the bottom up. Very important kinds of things. So, um, oh, uh, here's a question about hyperbaric chamber. Is it a good option for wound care? Well, again, I've had many patients that have huge successes with the hyperbaric chamber. That's where extra oxygen is put into a, a chamber. It's, it was hyperbaric was developed for people who uh, went diving and dove in the water too deep and got the bends in their lungs. So their lungs would be affected. So um, it started out as like a, a gigantic chamber that you would actually go in and sit and it would, uh, they would, change the pressure and then slowly bring it out so that would correct this lung thing that was going on. So they use it sometimes on wounds, um, big wounds on the bottom, might, you might need to go into a whole chamber like area, but now they have um, smaller devices where you can just put your arm in one or your leg in one or whatever. So you don't have the pressure to your whole body, which is important if you have uh, breathing problems. But um, but um, some people have a, a, a great deal of improvement with these. Other people do not. Now, why is that? Well, it could be a circulatory problem or it could be maybe that just isn't the right treatment for this particular wound. Um, sometimes people use the hyperbaric chamber and they're told you cannot put pressure on this wound, but guess what? They go home and they just don't tell anybody because they just sat for a few minutes. So those are, are, you know, there's all kinds of situations why it works for some and, and why it doesn't work for others. So, um, you know, if you have a wound that's not healing well, you can try that. Another thing, if you have a deep wound that's not healing well, you can try the wound vac, which is um, a device where you, you make an airtight seal around the wound. And then what's, what's applied is a vacuum, but it's a very, very um, light vacuum. So the debris from the wound is being removed the whole time that this vacuum is is on it. And then that stays sealed up for sometimes three days, sometimes longer, until the dressing has to be changed. It's just kind of sealed up doing its own thing. And so that's another option. Uh, but then we're talking about really uh, specialists, you might want to get involved with them um, because that will be important. They know oodles about wound care and they're very good at uh, treating wounds. There's all different kinds of dressings. Um, so yes, uh, do I have experience with um, Aleven and Ven Venilex? Yes. And you know, if they work well, there's a lot of treatments and they work well. It, the key to healing the wound is staying off the area. And that can be hard to do. If your wound is so bad that you require a surgical closure, 
you might have to be off the area and there's there is no give about this if you have a surgical uh, closure a flap where they rotate the skin and they rotate the muscle over the wound they clean it and then they rotate and clean and seal it up there's no negotiation you will be in bed for six months so sometimes staying off a red spot for a day might mean taking the day off from work, might mean missing family activities. But if you think, well, gee, I can heal up this red spot, if you do your skin checks, see it, find it early, I can heal that up in a day versus six months. I've heard of patients with um, surgical wound repairs that have to be in bed for a year. Um, not too long ago, there was a gentleman on TV who has spinal cord injury. And he, uh, he was on the news because he wanted to alert people that if you have to have this kind of care, it's pretty miserable. And he was like, I am never going to have another uh, wound because my gosh, I don't want to be in bed. He was in bed for a year trying to get his wound healed up. Now, once you have an open wound, um, once you have is now scarred so it's not your skin's not as elastic as our skin moves around you know our skin is so wonderful look at that how it just pulls over that i move my joint and the skin stretches i move it back and it just whips back into shape skin is quite marvelous after you have um, a wound that area basically is scarred tissue and it doesn't have elasticity anymore so you're much more susceptible to more wounds after you have one wound um, also don't forget your nutrition don't forget your hydration uh, drinking water those are all things that are important to for your internal body. Now this next question, and I know we have another question that was written in early, so I'm just gonna talk about this a little bit, because how does age play in wound care? And this is from Rosanna, and over 55. Well, let me tell you, some people you know, never have a wound problem, and then all of a sudden their skin just doesn't, it just doesn't seem to be as healthy as it was, it doesn't seem to be as thick as it was, was. I know that's one of the questions on the um, on, on the pre questions. Um, so guess what? We all get older, every single one of us. And so if you have made it to an old age that your skin is maybe a little more tender than it used to be, congratulations, you've made it to an older age. And so good for you. But that just means you have to pay more attention to your skin as you get older. So skin, like the rest of our body, changes as we get older. It's just you know, the way the nature of our human beingness is. So you just have to be more, vigilant with your skin checks you have to be you know look at your skin if you can't see you can't see your backside nobody can you can get a long handled mirror you can take your cell phone if you maybe feel back here you've got a something going on back there take a picture with your cell phone it's private it's on your own cell phone and then you can take a picture of your skin and so you know this is the day that the red spot occurred let me take a picture of it again tomorrow and see, you know, use my cell phone, see if it's resolved. You might have a caregiver who's looking at your backside where you can't see. It is still up to you to know. Things happen to caregivers. They get sick. They get the COVID. You know, it's snowed outside. Uh, there are all kinds of things. It is your body. You need to know what's going on with your body. So be sure and record because then you'll know exactly what it looked like. Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Um, sometimes in the hospital, we'll take a, a skin pen. It's a marker that you can mark on skin. And we'll draw a circle around the red area so we can see if it's getting bigger or if it's getting smaller. So those are all kinds of things uh, to do with those. Now here's a very good question about um, the, uh, this uh, uh, lady writes in and says her husband's preparing for exploratory surgery and we just discovered an open area on his tailbone which is superficial. He'll be on his back for four or five hour period. Any suggestions? Yes let them know that that's there. It might need to hold on the surgery until that area is has been um, resolved. Um, they might put what they call a duoderm, which is a certain kind of dressing over there to make sure. 
Uh, sometimes in surgery, if you have even a small opening in your skin, they won't do surgery because it's a site of infection and they don't want that infection in your body. So um, be sure and let them know right away. The surgery may need to be rescheduled. Um, a small open area, if you stay off of it on the tailbone, it's a very um, common place to get an open area because it's warm, it's moist, it's dark. Oh, it's got a bony prominence from the tail of the spine pressing, pressing down on it. It is just right for an area to break open. Um, so it, it, but it brings up another thing. If you have a spinal cord injury and you're going to have surgery, be sure and talk to your surgeon, the anesthesiologist, um, if you feel comfortable, uh, call the uh, nurse manager of the surgery department and say, I have a spinal cord injury at this level. I need special skin dispersing equipment. The response will be all of our operating tables are, are skin dispersing. And yes, that's true. They all have special cushioning, but you might need more cushioning. You might need an extra layer. Um, when you're anesthetized, anesthetized, we're all paralyzed during that time. None of us are twitching and moving and we twitch and move thousands of times a day. So, um, but you have a special issue. So be sure and talk to them. They're, they can get a special overlay for the operating table for people. Um, Sometimes people who have surgeries on their back or they, if they have their spine stabilized and they have to lay on their stomach, sometimes um, people have, you know, they're laying on their stomach and they end up with pressure injuries in kind of weird spots. So they might end up with a pressure injury here because you kind of lay on a, on, a, on a mat that looks kind of like where you put your head on um, uh, when you get a massage, you know, you put your head on that round open area. So sometimes people come out with a pressure injury, they heal up pretty fast, or a pressure injury on your chin or a pressure injury on your nose, maybe from a tube or maybe um, uh, from where your uh, ventilator tubing had been taped or something. They heal up really fast and people are like, well, I had a pressure injury on my, on my face. People really get upset when they have a pressure injury on their on their face because that's what everybody sees but they heal up really fast and why do they because you don't have pressure you're not sitting on your chin you're not sitting on your forehead you're not laying on that part of your body so they heal up pretty fast so it's a good idea to double check and double check and double check to make sure you have all everything that can be done to avoid pressure injury during surgery um, we have a next one here who says they uh, were sent to PT and they just kept applying Silvasorb gel. The wound would not heal. So uh, this is an interesting phenomenon in healthcare that's happening right now is that um, nurses manage uh, pressure injuries. That's, that's our thing and we do it. But guess what? Nurses get paid um, in the hospital bill or nurses are hired by physicians. Nurses don't generally bill. Now, um, some nurses that are nurse practitioners can bill, and so we'll have to see how all this plays out. But physical therapists, occupational ther therapists bill fee for service. So a lot of the wound care has gone to physical therapy. Newer people in physical therapy are being educated about wound care. Not everyone has been, but they still can provide treatment for wound care. Um, many physical therapists go to their association, they take classes, they understand it, but they don't have really a lot of experience in it. They don't have, um, I don't mean to offend, I'm not, I'm not I'm not picking on anybody, but there's the whole constellation of the body that nurses look at. Um, your nutrition, your hydration, they look at all of these things, your seating equipment, they look at everything. Um, sometimes other people maybe don't have that total body view. I'm not saying that physical therapists do not, I'm just saying sometimes um, people are just looking at the issue. There's a wound care, so we're gonna fix this wound. Um, and it can be anybody, nurses sometimes do it as well. And so um, if that uh, Silvasorb gel is not working, uh, you obviously need something else. If the wound is not getting smaller, if it's not healing from the bottom up, 
It shouldn't be smaller at the opening. It should be healing from the bottom up. It might take a long time to heal the wound, but you can always ask for a wound care consult. There's nothing wrong with doing that, and those are people who specialize in nothing but wound care. And so if you're feeling like your wound is not healing, ask for a second opinion. No one should be offended by that. I know people are always kind of a little hesitant for asking for a second opinion, but go ahead and ask for one because it's, it's very, very important. A second set of eyes on anything is always good. Uh, wounds do not heal up overnight. It takes a long time, sometimes weeks, sometimes months. So, and, and you have to stay off of it. So if you're using the Silvasorb gel, which is perfectly fine, uh, 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 wound treatment, but if you're still applying pressure, it's going to take even longer. And so those are, you know, some of the complications of doing that. Um, doing your pressure releases are going to help uh, to prevent that uh, wound from, from ever occurring to begin with. So be sure and think about, you know, doing pressure releases. You can set the timer on your phone. Uh, some people wear a little watch that vibrates and oh, time to pressure release. Um, other things that you can do is um, I notice I notice that people watching TV. If you if you watch a lot of TV, I have my TV on practically all the time because I just like the noise in the house. But um, TV commercials run about every ten minutes. Perfect timing every time. Pressure, you know, do a pressure release. If you work in a busy office, every time the phone rings, if you, um, every time you hit enter, if you do it, yes, it takes time, it stops, it interrupts, but it'll save you from a pressure injury. It's probably worth the time and effort to do it. Now there's some more questions. And so I'm going to put these on because guess what? I'm getting older. My body's getting older. The eyes don't work so well. I have to look over here to uh, see the questions that were asked prior to the session. Um, and this is one I really wanted to talk about. The first question, I'm so glad you wrote this in. It's about a person who's having repeated fungus in the groin area. And the treatment in, is difficult to do because they're in a, in a wheelchair. And when you're in a wheelchair, your legs are pushed together. That makes the whole groin in that moist, dark area. And so fungus likes to live in moist, Dark areas. And so they, they're having some trouble because um, they, they don't use diapers, but apparently um, that area is moist. So um, I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, a lot of times people with spinal cord injury don't have um, sweating ability, but sometimes you can have leakage um, from your bladder or you can have leakage from the bowel, which a lot of people don't think about because unless you see something in, in your underwear or, you know, you happen to notice smell, but people pass gas all the time. You know, there's a children's book, the gas we pass, everybody passes gas. And so even with a spinal cord injury, even if your bowel is slow, there's going to be a little bit of emissions that you're not going to be able to see. And that's all connected together in the groin. So um, things get spread around down there and you don't really notice it because you don't see that gas and a little bit of moisture that is uh, passed with that. So um, how, can, how can they do that? They're using some medicine. Now, this is the thing about groin rashes, and she's uh, quick to point out that it's not a diaper rash, and, and, that, and that is true. There's all kinds of fungus. Um, so what fungus hate the most is air and light. So if you can position, not when they're in the wheelchair, but if you can take breaks during the day, remove the lower clothes, spread the legs out, open so that air and light. You have to be careful where you do this. You can't do this um, uh, where somebody might accidentally walk in or, you know, if you're in the house, be sure you have the curtains closed. If somebody can, you know, see from one apartment to the other, you want to be careful about privacy. But um, spread eagle, that really helps. There are all kinds of fungus and there are all kinds of treatment for fungus. So they're using uh, one kind of fungus treatment but maybe that's not the fungus. This is a broad spectrum treatment that they're using, but maybe that's not the fungus that, they, that this person has. So it's always perfectly acceptable to say, you know, we just are not getting on top of this fungus. 
I don't think the ointment is working. Could we try a different one? And they'll say yes, because they're all different kinds of fungus. Um, if you think about uh, little babies with diaper rash, and it's, fungus is not necessarily a diaper rash, but if you try some of the over the product, over the counter kinds of products, you, you might have better luck. Now, if the fungus comes back, because again, you're sitting in the wheelchair, the legs are closed, it might be a completely different kind of fungus. So things are always evolving. So one, one fungus treatment does not work for all kinds of fungus in the groin. So it's good to experiment, but check with your healthcare provider always first to make sure but the more you can leave the, the area open to air clean and dry um, the the faster the fungus will go away and if you can get some uh, light to that area so you know if you, if you have the person uh, laying with their legs spread open men or women either one uh, sometimes you might have to um, use a towel to support the penis and the scrotum because sometimes it's laying up against the skin. So you might need to put a towel under there so that the air can circulate underneath there. But um, then sometimes people will do it and they'll put a blanket over them for modesty, but you need to have it open to the air and to the light, you see, that's very important. So those are, those are some ideas that might help with that. Um, question about personal protective equipment that should be used during the pandemic while doing passive range of motion, who's at high risk for respiratory illness. Um, and then what about this flu season? Yes, the COVID is going to be um, a huge hit during this flu season. Um, personal protective equipment should always be uh, wearing a mask over the nose, over the mask, sealed tight around the area, or sealed securely, I should say. Um, some people might want to use a paper towel within the mask to have some double protection. A coffee filter I put in mine, um, a folded up coffee filter because it's pressed paper. And a pressed paper seems to work best. The pressed paper mask, like the surgical mask, tend to work uh, better. And it's like by so many hundredths of a percentage. So we're not talking about a wide difference here. But if you want to put an extra filter in there, of course, washing hands, uh, being careful that the person doesn't ha that's doing the a range of motion doesn't have a fever, that they've not been exposed. Um, all those typical kinds of things that we're doing now in the pandemic. And then what about the annual uh, flu season? Well, it's the end of October. This is really an important year to get your flu shot. Really important because if you get the flu and you get the COVID, it's like a double hit in, in your body. And so it's gonna be even harder to fight off two viruses than one virus. So um, be sure and get your flu shot. Um, they were available at the end of September, early October. I got mine early October. Now that's kind of early in the season, usually by the end of October, but knowing that the COVID was out there and I am also immunosuppressed because I don't have a functioning spleen. And so I was really concerned about this. So I know in February, I might need to get a second flu shot. And I'm okay with that because I really don't wanna get any of those kind of things. Although I isolate my house and I got a cold and I'm like, hmm, how did I get that? I haven't been out and about. And, but you know, there are all these germs and viruses just in the world circulating around. So we cannot be too sure. So be sure and uh, wear your mask if you have hand function and don't have respiratory problems. So uh, it's important if you can wear a mask to wear it. If you can't, that um, and sheltering in place is very important. Washing your hands, I touch my face so much. I can't believe it. Um, so when I go to the store, um, if I do get to go to the grocery store, which I do about once every three weeks, just because I gotta get out of the house, um, I do wear those food service gloves. Uh, they're not, really resilient enough for pushing your wheelchair. Um, there's evidence now that wearing gloves, uh, it, it really doesn't do anything because as soon as you touch something with your glove on, it's contaminated. So I see people in the uh, food service industry and they're wearing their gloves, but they're taking your money, they're handling your food. It's just like your hands. You need to wash your hands. 
But what I find that when I'm out, if I have my little cheapy little food service gloves on, I have them on and I don't touch my face. And that's really important. And then remove my gloves right away, wash hands or use hand sanitizer. Uh, you cannot wash your hands or use hand, hand sanitizer enough. Well, that just keeps us all healthy. What, uh, the next question is, what kind of specialist would I talk to to identify specific points on my body for electrical stimulation? That can be done with your healthcare provider or with your physical therapist or even your occupational therapist if you're thinking about your hands and arms, they do uh, electrical stimulation there too. So uh, before you start any kind of electrical stimulation program, be sure and check with your healthcare provider to make sure you have the right kind of device, that you're doing it correctly, um, that you have the, the uh, electrodes in the correct spot, that you're not giving yourself too much current, too little current, you know, there are all these things. So it's not the kind of thing that you should just order um, a nerve stem device online and then just take it up and start zapping yourself. You really need to have education and training. You can get burns uh, from the electrodes and that's a skin issue. Um, and then you have a burn on your skin and you have to treat it like any other kind of burn. And some of these burns can be very serious. The electrodes can be used over and over again. I think the packaging says not to. And the reason why is that they get damaged. That's when these burns can happen. If you have lotion on your skin, that serves as a conductor and can, um, can carry that electrical current through your skin, which can create a burn. Um, some people use the uh, electrodes, the patches that go on the skin, they'll use them over and over. If you take a little Dawn detergent and take your finger and just wipe them, you can't dip them in water, but just kind of rinse it off with Dawn because it gets the grease off of them, the body grease, the body oils. And so uh, again, your therapist can uh, educate you on how to do these things properly. So um, there are different points that you wanna hit for electrical stimulation in particular, where you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck. So be sure and get education and training. If you don't have uh, rehabilitation benefits for therapy, it can be coded as mobility training. And most people have two weeks of uh, mobility training or mo mobility education. Uh, and so you can get extra things in that two weeks per year that you get. So be sure and, and look into that. Talk to your healthcare professional about that. Um, here's a person that has chronic pain in their arms and they're changing the medication. Uh, they're doing exercises, even using cream uh, with hemp and uh, the pain is like somebody gripping me. And I know there's another question further down. So I, I just wanna address pain for a minute. Gripping pain to me sounds like um, spasms. Um, neuropathic pain sounds more, uh, uh, feels more like burning, tingling kind of pain. Now, that's a general rule for every general rule in healthcare. There's the opposite is also true. So um, it could be neuropathic pain or it could be spasm pain. So you need to speak to your healthcare professional about uh, treatment. So you're on medication, it takes about six weeks for the medications to kick in. That's a long time. Um, some people think I've been on this medication for a week, two weeks, it's not working. It's not gonna work for six weeks. And then after six weeks, it might not be enough of a dose. You have to go up on your dose, you have to wait another six weeks. This is why this is so complicated to treat. And then if it's spasming pain, um, there's medications that you can take for muscle spasms. There's also Botox injections. If it's just an isolated place, but in both arms, talk to your physician about Botox. If it's a neuropathic pain or spasms, sometimes spasms, the Botox will help. Um, if it's uh, neuropathic pain, Botox may or may not help because neuropathic pain sometimes causes spasms. If you can treat the spasms, sometimes that helps reduce the neuropathic pain. But there again, you really need to have your healthcare provider look at this and decide um, what is the treatment for you. So keep going with it. If you find that you're just not getting enough help, you can ask for a referral to a pain 
specialist. Um, be sure that you're um, talking to somebody who treats people who have, who have neuropathic pain because it's different than other kinds of body pains. Um, pain, there's a booklet on the Reed Foundation about pain control that goes through the whole hierarchy of treatment and everything that you can do to try for treating pain. So be sure and, and get that book because um, that, that will be very important. Um, so here's a question that just came in. Can a dressing itself cause pressure? Um, usually the dressing doesn't cause pressure. If it does, it's been applied incorrectly. Um, so usually dressings don't necessarily cause pressure. The tape can cause some tears to that surface of the skin. If the skin is not well hydrated, um, uh, Coumadin, should not really affect skin tears. Coumadin really affects more bruising. Once bruising is the skin uh, has more, more blood in there, so the skin's not working as uh, well as it should. So that could be like a Coumadin bruising tear kind of cascade of events. So um, if you keep your skin well hydrated, if you can drink, if you're on a a bladder program, you have to stay within your regulations, but water is the best hydration. Um, putting um, some uh, emollient type of lotion on the skin. Some, some lotions are very dry, drying, so choose some of the more uh, medical type of lotions. I'm going to say, um, I don't like to name brands, but I'm going to give an example like um, Eucerin is a good one. Uh, Sarah V comes to mind, and there are um, oh, Aquaphor is uh, like a Vaseline type of thing. It doesn't have the fragrances and all that. It's just a real moisturizing. It's a little bit uh, more like well, it's like Vaseline, so it's a little bit messier. But you can kind of work that in a little bit better. I like all of those, but there are many others, and I I use all different kinds. So. Um, uh, just thinking about uh, when you're on Coumadin, trying to avoid those bruises. I know you see people with the bruises on the back of their hands because they bump their hand on something. And, and you, if you're on the Coumadin or even the baby aspirin for a long time, sometimes people start getting those bruises on their skin. So um, talk to your doctor. Make sure that you're uh, following up with your uh, blood testing to make sure you're not over coagulated that you know you haven't gotten your blood too thin but those bruising is a consequence of that so you just need to be careful um, if you end up with bruises on your arms or elbows or feet or legs you can always wear uh, protective uh, heel bows or elbows or sometimes if you wear a heel bow just like if you're getting bruises like along your arm here instead of wearing it on the elbow you can wear it the padding along here and make sure you have padded armrests and those kinds of things as well. Um, let's see. Oh, um, there, oh, here's another person that they had a spinal cord injury and they're having pain and they've had a pain for a year. So yes, there is help for you. You're, you're, you need treatment for your pain and it can be treated. It does take a while to get the right treatment. Um, but you should be actively working on that with your healthcare professional. If your healthcare professional is uh, saying, well, you know, we just need to see if this goes away or whatever, ask for a referral to a pain specialist or um, our spinal cord injury uh, physician, a physiatrist that uh, treats people with spinal cord injury. They can help you with these pain. They know all the different techniques. Get that pain booklet and read that pain booklet so that you can go with ideas that you can question your physician about. What about this treatment? What about that treatment? Chronic pain is one of the most horrible things to have to live with, and it really affects your quality of life. So really uh, be sure and ask for more help. It does not hurt. You, you know, you need, to, you need to find some place uh, where you can get treatment for this. And there's plenty of people out there that would be willing to help you. So you just need to know where to look. So be sure and get that uh, pain booklet. I think it'll come up in the chat here where you can click on to get that pain booklet. Um, if not, go to the Reeve. Uh, oh, 
and magically it appears. Thank you, Chris. I know you did that. Um, so be sure and check the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis website because there's all kinds of information and it's all free. So you just have to open it up and you can find out all kinds of information. Um, uh, is there a homemade something for when you're allergic to everything, a lotion or a homemade something? Well, um, I don't know of anything homemade. There probably is uh, homemade stuff. I know um, for a while there we were using things like Crisco and Vaseline and our um, cooking oil on um, calluses. Calluses are very important to get reduced, but you need to reduce them properly, not sharp with a knife because the skin underneath them is real tender. So you need to, you need to very slowly re reduce, uh, reduce uh, calluses um, just by soaking and then buffing them with a washcloth or towel. And you just keep working at it and working at it because as the callus gets smaller, the skin underneath will uh, toughen up. If you remove a callus right now, that skin is just so thin and tender. And the minute it hits any kind of surface, it just breaks open. And then you've got an open area in your skin where things can, um, bacteria can enter and it's just a mess. It can set off a uh, pain stimulus to your body that might be interpreted as autonomic dysreflexia and it's a whole cascade. And so you don't want to do that. I know we're running low on time, but there is one more question I wanted to ask and it's from a, a, a person who works in a rehabilitation setting and it's about rehabilitation nursing. And so when I saw this, I thought, oh yes, I'm answering this question because this is one of those things where uh, people come to rehabilitation nursing in various ways. Um, I, I came to rehabilitation nursing from healthcare issues that had been in my family and so was, you know, kind of aware of it. I think that most people don't stop and think about rehabilitation nursing when they go in, into any kind of health care. And the reason is because we don't see it on TV. What's the matter, Hollywood? Come on. Let's get a good TV program about a rehabilitation facility. I think it would be fabulous. Um, boy, I tell you, I could fill, I could fill a, a movie or um, years of a TV program with some interesting stories. And they're not interesting stories about patients. That's confidential, but the underbelly of working in the healthcare world is just kind of a fascinating. So Hollywood call, I'm ready. I've got the stories for you. But um, what I think that nurses, nurses go into nursing because of what they see on TV mostly. Every once in a while, you'll have somebody who goes into nursing because they had a family member or they had a healthcare issue themselves, and then they usually want to go into that particular branch of healthcare. But you know, people never see any kind of rehabilitation on TV. There was a program uh, not too long ago uh, where the person uh, got shot and became paralyzed or something and they uh, they got a robot for walking and it was very cool because you know that is all very cool but how many people in the real world actually get that kind of opportunity so you know it, it was good it woke people up to there's all kinds of things going on in the world but but anyway so most nurses come in and they're fascinated with the task and I know this all too well, because when nurses come to nursing school, their first thing is, when do I get to give my first shot? When do I get to start an IV? Those are just the tasks. Those are just things that you have to go do. You have to do them correctly, but those are things that you do. Nursing is about the art and the science. And the art is being able to help people to get into their world of what's important to them and to work with them in their understanding and how to take care of themselves. And that is the hard part. We should, we should um, talk more about that. Um, the Association of Rehabilitation Nurses Conference is, has uh, just concluded today. We had our last session today. And it's been a fabulous conference. Um, last year, I was unable to go for a variety of reasons, but I was so disappointed I couldn't go. And, and so you can't see, but I've got my ARN shirt on because I was at the meeting today. And so this year, I decided I, I bought this. Th these shirts became available. And I thought, oh, I have to have one because when I go to conference, I'm going to proudly wear my ARN shirt. Well, 
I couldn't go last year. And this year, because of the pandemic, it's all on Zoom. So it didn't matter. I was wearing my ARN uh, clothing with pride because I think that when you get involved in foundations or in uh, organizations like that, or when you're involved in the Reed Foundation, you see other people working in rehabilitation nursing, you hear stories about other people, and then I think you kind of get the idea of role modeling. And when you work in a facility, um, you certainly see the other nurses and it's good uh, to provide them with a mentor to talk to the new nurses. Uh, they come from all walks of life. They're all ages. People go into nursing as a second career and they have so much valuable life experiences when they get there. So the, uh, I think that role modeling is probably the best, but it is difficult when you get a new nurse because when they're out of school, they're task oriented. This is what I have to do and this is how I do it. And just to think of going in a room and just talking to a patient has it's been a part of their education, but they've been so nervous about learning the task and the skills. So I think just uh, having them follow really good rehabilitation nurses to kind of get a feel for what it's like. Boy, if we could get a program on TV about rehabilitation, it would just change everything. When we had our mentor, Christopher Reeve, people were aware of rehabilitation. Michael J. Fox is another one. I think that um, he is one that has done a lot for rehabilitation. I think he's more interested in expanding his career now. So he's kind of doing more of those kind of things, but his foundation is great. There's a lot of great foundations for rehabilitation. With that, I am well over my time, but I thank you all for coming. If I didn't get to your question today, I am on the uh, Reeve community website. So be sure and log on, I'll be on tonight. Uh, from 7 to 8 central time. You can put a message to me privately in my mailbox or you can ask it just on the on the community site. It's wonderful when people make their uh, questions public because every single question I get are questions that other people have the same question but you know people are kind of embarrassed for whatever reason they might not want to you know, put their name on something, that's fine. But everybody has the same question as you. So just be sure and look. And uh, I'll see you on the website. I'll, I'll be uh, writing on the blog every week. So um, one way or another, we'll catch up. I thank you for coming and enjoy your week. Enjoy your month and stay safe from the COVID. Thank you.